Thank you so much, Jonathan, for a wonderful introduction. Um, it's a, such a pleasure and honor to be here and meeting you all. Uh, I'm excited uh, to be in this space. There's a lot of work that has come from here that has inspired the work that I'm going to share. Um, as you'll see, there's a lot of synergies. And uh, um, yeah, so I, I'm also your neighbor. <laughs> We're right up the road at uh, UMBC. Um, so I was, I usually don't drive, but today I was driving. And I realize uh, when there's not a lot of traffic, it's 15, 20 minutes, so not very far. Okay, uh, so I'm going to kind of try to cover a lot of material, some of it kind of more in detail, some of it less, but um, as any any point, if you if anybody has a question, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna see the Zoom uh, questions at this point, uh, but uh, please raise a hand or put a comment and I'll keep an eye on that. So. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so yeah, feel free to interrupt me. Um, also, I'll have my contact information at the end if anybody wants to have more conversations after or ask for any of the papers that I mentioned or sources, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to share. Okay, so as Jonathan kindly uh, mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in information systems and faculty in the human-centered computing uh, program at uh, UMBC. Uh, so kind of closer to uh, Baltimore physically, geographically. And a lot of my uh, research uh, kind of takes place outside of the university. It's by the nature of the participatory community engaged um, uh, type of work that I do. So I have a number of photos here from some of the activities we do. Um, and I'll go into uh, detail later, but you'll notice that uh, there's a lot of hands-on activities. There's kind of a range of things. We have some biology, um, uh, processes kind of being done there, some hands-on prototyping, 3D printing, et cetera. Uh, some of these are at the at the university lab, um, and some of them, as I said, a lot of them outside of the university, either in Baltimore City or in other sites. Another thing I want to point out here is that there's a lot of um, other people than me in this, uh, in this photo, and uh, I work with everybody from high school students, uh, kind of uh, bottom down for, from a project, um, to postdocs, to artists, to re other researchers, um, all the way up, uh, masters, undergrad undergraduates, and PhD students. So there's a range of uh, collaborations and participants that take place uh, in projects. Okay, so for this talk, the way I kind of organized it, um, the introduction was done. <laughs> so that was kind of the first part. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my approach, uh, community-based participatory design. And participatory design, I know there's a lot of uh, also experts here and knowledge uh, that has been here historically. Uh, so I'll go through that very briefly. Uh, but then I want to focus on two, um, but secretly three uh, projects. So one of the projects kind of has another one nested in it. Um, and then I'll kind of give an overview of the type of, of some of the other work that I've done in case if anybody's interested to talk more. So uh, participatory design is a well-known methodology um, started in the Scandinavia in the uh, 60s, 70s, uh, mostly kind of related to workplace democracy movement. We're thinking about how can we uh, incorporate um, uh, multiple stakeholder perspectives in design processes and create systems that impact people who are going to use them. So that's a very broad um, definition. Uh, in, after the 60s, 70s, participatory design has also moved out of the workplace, and that's the area that I'm mostly interested in. Um, and in, in something that, in, in a uh, kind of a reformulation that uh, several people have uh, described as community-based participatory design. So thinking about how some of the methodologies and philosophy of participatory design can be applied outside of the workplace. So thinking about um, mutual learning, for example, as a core principle in participatory design. So thinking about uh, kind of unsettling some of the traditional quote unquote relationships between designers and users and workers. Um, so thinking about people coming uh, to the design table uh, the, the or the design space with their lived experiences and with their um, kind of identities and how can we work with that as assets and as uh, founds of uh, knowledge rather than uh, kind of trying to solve problems or or address issues only. I mean, solving problems are also really important. Um, so that's kind of the overall 
uh, methodology methodological approach that kind of informs my work. Also, I'm very much interested in transdisciplinarity that I'm going to talk a little more later um, and community engagement. So thinking about what are ways that our scholarship can be really situated uh, within communities, uh, diverse communities that are going to be potentially impacted by technology. Sometimes the outcome of these processes are technological solutions or ideas or implications. Um, often they're not. They might be experiences, there might be um, uh, kind of guidelines, there might be community resources uh, that are not necessarily um, kind of looked at uh, from an academic perspective and so on. So this will become a little bit more clear as I go through uh, the project. So I use those um, that general methodology and approach in a range of different things. So this is just an overview of some of the projects that I've uh, been working on in the past few years. Um, I'm going to talk about two of them in detail, so I won't go into them, living media interfaces and uh, do-it-yourself assistive technology. Uh, but I did want to give a little bit of an overview of some of the projects that I won't have time to go into today. So uh, I'm very interested in equity-based making. So uh, many, if not all of you, are familiar with making, uh, the idea of maker uh, practices, um, ideas. And this is a notion of mostly amateur, non-expert um, uh, learners, designers kind of coming together and building things together. It can be physical things, it can be uh, software. Um, but over, uh, I mean, the past few decades, there's been a lot of interest in this movement, a lot of it from learning sciences. Now, a challenge is that making has been also shown to have some exclusionary issues. So uh, I'm very much interested in how can we kind of rethink uh, what making is and bring equity-based perspectives into um, practices of making. We might also want to stop using that word as, in some context. So that's something that I'm really interested in, and we have several projects in NSA, in uh, uh, Baltimore City and beyond, Pittsburgh and so on, looking at, uh, at that. Another area that I'm interested, and this will touch on some of the projects I'm going to talk about today, is community infrastructure and community infrastructure. So the idea of uh, addressing issues, uh, historical sometimes, sometimes uh, um, kind of geopolitical, uh, where communities don't have uh, adequate uh, access to resources, to services, and so on. How can we kind of rethink and re redesign some of these issues um, with community perspective and participation, and very importantly, leadership. In a lot of my projects, I strive to, um, to a model of leadership that the community takes the lead, and uh, the university or other stakeholders, the government, and so on, kind of follow that lead, support that. Uh, perspective. Uh, I've become very interested also in environmental justice. I think some of the issues there are really um, urgent to look into, um, and I'm happy to talk to people if they're interested after that. Um, another aspect is thinking about privacy, and uh, inclusive privacy, of course, is a really big area, but the specifically thinking about assistive technologies and how questions of privacy come up in relation to that, and what are some of the uh, trade-offs that um, we kind of, or negotiations that we face uh, uh, when we're kind of designing or using uh, assistive technologies. Uh, there's a lot of challenges and interesting questions there. For example, how to talk about privacy, um, how to make sure that people actually can exercise some degree of agency when their uh, privacy uh, questions arise. Um, uh, it's interesting because sometimes when we think of assistive technology, uh, we might think of hardware systems, but of course there's a lot of software, uh, but increasingly hardware systems have software and those software might collect data and new questions around what are the privacy issues that come up uh, in relation to these hardware, IoT devices and so on, or software uh, that are collecting data in order to improve their uh, functionality arise. So I'm very interested in that area. So thinking about participatory approaches to privacy as it relates to assistive technology. Um, okay, and there are two other projects I'm going to talk about uh, in detail. So first, uh, I want to go to the, the, the pro a project on uh, do-it-yourself assistive technology. So um, I didn't know there was a TV show, so I'm going to look it up. <laughs> but oh, they are the whole network, yes. Uh, okay, cool, cool. Um, yeah, so um, when I kind of talk about DIY assistive technology, I mean assistive technologies uh, or technologies that are designed specifically for people with disabilities. And, and there is some high degree of participation of people with disabilities in that 
uh, in the design. This is not always the case when you hear about DIY assistive technology because um, it might refer to technologies that are also built outside of industry, but for people with disabilities, but sometimes they're not participating in the building or design of them. Um, there's a lot of examples uh, that have kind of emerged. I have a few on the uh, in the slide here. Um, they kind of range from kind of complicated devices like prosthetics and so on to more simpler uh, devices, 3D printed grips, for example, that are customized can be really helpful. And um, and there's it's a big question like what is appropriate to build in uh, using a DIY approach versus a more uh, kind of top-down industrial design approach. So uh, that's kind of one area I'm interested in. But I'm also specifically very interested in what happens in ecosystems and infrastructures that enable uh, DIY. Because sometimes when we talk about DIY, the image that might come to mind is that you go to, um, let's say, a hardware store, you get some material, maybe you go to a makerspace, you build something. Often, infrastructures are invisible. Um, and, uh, and especially when it comes to infrastructures outside of uh, Western contexts like North America, Europe, uh, et cetera, where a lot of these uh, previous work has been done, we don't have a very clear understanding of what is the impact of infrastructure and the ecosystem of resources on these type of practices. So as I was kind of working on uh, some of these projects during my PhD, I had a colleague, um, several colleagues who were doing work in uh, um, Kenya. And they were very interested in thinking about accessibility and assistive technology in the Kenyan context. So, uh, and there are several reasons for that. One is that Kenya is a tech leader in East Africa. So historically, it's been a leader in developing technologies that have been taken up not only in uh, Kenya, but a lot of countries in the region and beyond. So you might have heard of Ushahidi um, and, and other, uh, M-Pesa is a, a digital, payment method uh, that have been, that are kind of homegrown, let's say. And there's a lot of um, kind of uh, technology hubs and startup uh, incubation centers and so on uh, coming up in, in Kenya. So there's that side, there's interest and talent. Uh, another side is that Kenya has uh, recently, relatively recently passed legislation around uh, protecting the rights of people with disabilities. And so there is an imp uh, a movement from the government side and uh, non-governmental organizations to explore um, how to actually make it happen, how to make the legislation uh, come forward. So there were some questions there. And the colleague I was working with at a nonprofit in um, Western Kenya, very close to Uganda. In, uh, I, I think it's the third largest uh, city in Kenya, uh, uh, Kisumu. It's right in uh, on Lake uh, Victoria. And, and basically, uh, the, he, they invited us to uh, go and explore some of the possibilities of uh, this approach of participatory uh, creating uh, assistive technologies in that context. At the time, I had uh, co-designed a system that's a very basic um, augmented and alternative communication device. Um, it's, a, it's like a communication board, essentially, uh, with a teacher who worked with uh, kids with uh, communication disability. So these were often nonverbal children who uh, basically um, he wanted them to be able to communicate with their classmates, with each other, and to be able to uh, kind of learn about uh, this type of device. So of course, there's a lot of devices like this that exist, some of them hardware, uh, some of them software, it could be app, there's a lot of apps that you can find and so on. But the challenge was that um, a lot of these were not customizable. So for example, the buttons or the uh, many options that were on the screen could be very confusing uh, to some of the kids or some of the users. Um, and so he wanted to kind of change that up. And we kind of together uh, came up with a design, very simple one where we had a Raspberry Pi, we had um, capacitive sensors kind of attached together with the audio system and so on. And you could really kind of uh, customize the hardware here. Uh, fairly easily. So you could kind of have one button, you could have two buttons, you could have images, you could have it circular, um, anything you could, you wanted. So in terms of the form and also the audio that you uh, uploaded into it. So you could change the audio. So this was kind of a basic device that we had. And this is an image where um, one of his students is kind of using it. Uh, she's sitting in a wheelchair. Uh, I think she had cerebral palsy and she's nonverbal and she's basically completing an exercise. 
Um, so my colleague from Kenya, Patrick, uh, was very interested in this device. He said that we've worked with several schools in that region, both rural and urban, that um, want to uh, that have a lot of kids with different disabilities, and they want uh, to have technologies uh, for communication, and they don't have a lot of access to interactive technology. The interactivity piece was really interesting. So I said, well, let's uh, uh, think of this as a uh, design uh, probe. We can bring it here. We can have a conversation uh, about what does it mean to have this type of uh, do-it-yourself assistive technology in the Kenyan context. So um, we kind of deconstructed this uh, device into a prototyping kit, essentially, and we brought it to uh, Kisumo, uh, the, the area that he was active in. Uh, and this is really important. I mean, in, it might sound like Kisumu is pretty like a random point in the map, uh, but the reason that we chose that spot is because my um, colleague had a very, very long term. I think he was active there for 10 years. He still is very much rooted in the community. He had a lot of connections there. And this is empirical, very, very important for uh, any type of participatory work. You want to work with people who are embedded in the communities, they know, uh, and they can kind of bring people together. So uh, we started the, what turned out to be a very long-term project. Um, it was supposed to be a couple of years. Um, it's probably about five years we worked on it. At this point, it's kind of wrapped up. I won't go into a lot of details, but we did a lot of activities in this uh, uh, project. So uh, we did a stakeholder mapping, and I'm happy to share the slides after, uh, but there's also details in the paper that I've um, uh, kind of mentioned below. below which actually just came out, so 2023, in T-Access. So it's hot off the press, <laughs> um, and it kind of describes all the steps. Uh, but I'm just going to kind of mention a couple of little things here. One, for example, is stakeholder mapping. So maybe uh, some of you or all of you are familiar with this method. Uh, this is kind of a systematic way of kind of thinking about who are the people, who are the stakeholders, uh, how are they connected. And this is a participatory process that you have to do with your part, um, uh, with your stakeholders. So we basically brought together, and thanks to Patrick and his connections, a lot of people from the government, from the local government, from the um, um, kind of the national government, from agencies active in that space, teachers, um, journalists um, and, and many people who were kind of involved in these questions came together and we started building uh, some maps. And interestingly, um, and this almost always happens, we found some connections and some that are missing. And so people were very interested in kind of reaching out to each other, even in the stakeholder meeting. There were people who came and that they had heard about some organization, but they never met anybody from there. So that was kind of one of the outcomes of this uh, project. It was not necessarily, and that's what I was saying at the beginning, is that it doesn't necessarily have to be a technology outcome. It can also be networking, community building, community engagement. And so that was kind of one of the pieces. But we were also very interested in what happens if actually this device is redesigned and co-designed um, and appropriated in, in a positive sense by um uh, teachers and, and kids in the schools. So we brought them to the schools. We left a bunch of them. We actually, again, like there was a lot of activities. So we trained some university students from the local university and a couple of people from a technology hub who were really interested in uh, this potential idea as a potential future uh, device that could be manufactured there. So they were trained in how this works at every level. So how to customize it. I had actually written the code for it fairly simple code, but uh, for the Raspberry Pi that was running this, so I could show it to somebody there so they can debug it and so on if needed. And then we brought some of the materials and they basically uh, went to the schools and over a period of, I think it was three months, um, they basically tried it out. And the idea here was that we would kind of want to the teachers to use it any way they want. And if they wanted to change things, they would talk to the students and they would help them change things, optimize things and so on. I have some photos here. We don't have a lot of photos, but there are some here. Um, and we noticed a few interesting things that were very different from what we had expected. One was that um, this device was always shared in the school. So when I went to, it was very, it's a fascinating uh, experience I had. When I went to one of the schools, I asked them uh, in one of the initial visits, what kind of technologies do you already have? So we can kind of work with them and think about them and maybe combine them together. And he brought me to a room and he it was locked and he opened the room and it was a number of PCs, very old ones there. And he said, this is our technology. We have a one day class where 
some of the students come and kind of uh, work with these computers, but we usually lock the doors because we were afraid they might break them. Another issue was that a lot of the devices were donated. So it was one computer of each kind and they were not updated, they were really old. And it was something that was basically not, they were not using them. So a lot of these kids had not used any interactive device. Um, therefore, the teachers who were uh, very, uh, they, had, they had an excellent strategy for not creating tension in the classroom. Because if you have one device you give to one person, there's gonna be a lot of issues with that. So every class, they made sure that everybody got to work with the device. So in some capacity, and they had to come up with new ways of doing that. One of the ways was that they recorded all the names of the kids in the class, and they would actually go around the class and play that. So that's how they did their um, kind of initial warm up. Uh, another way was that they would kind of integrate it into the activities of the class. So for example, if they were learning about animals or name of countries or something like that, they would record that, pre-record that into the device, and then all the kids got to participate. For them, it was really important that the kids in the class can participate because without the devices, some of the nonverbal uh, kids had more difficulty. And, and the other thing was that these classes had a lot of kids with different disabilities. So some of them uh, were verbal, some of them were high functioning, some of them had uh, more challenges. Uh, another interesting kind of um, outcome that we saw here was that they were kind of trying to really use some of the local material there. So I brought a bunch of, um, I think I showed in the initial photo, some prototyping material for the initial phases of the work, uh, but they really wanted to use local material because they, they were thinking about what would happen in the long term if something like this was gonna uh, stay here. And and so there was somebody who kind of worked with a um, uh, like local a woodworker who built a few versions of this device, which were really interesting. And also they kind of tried did a lot of trial er error with um, conductive material to be able to create the buttons themselves. Now, some of the uh, feedback we got uh, uh, from the participants was really interesting. I have a lot of conflict around like what happens if somebody has a technology, uh, an experience with technology, and then um, that's it. Like there is not a sustained uh, use because in from a learning science educational perspective, you really kind of want to have continued use, lots of practice uh, to become, uh, to have some mastery with, uh, with an aspect of the technology or, or skill and so on. Um, but I think some of our results at this in this project show that even a small number of, or a small amount of experience can lead to impactful and long-term uh, outcomes. So uh, we did a series of interviews, it is in the, uh, paper that I mentioned, and uh, with the caregivers of the kids. And uh, they were kind of describing some of the outcomes that were very surprising to me. So for example, in this code, uh, TalkBox, by the way, was the name of the device that we had to blow. Uh, before, this is a caregiver sharing about their experience with their child. Uh, before TalkBox, he couldn't pick up a phone or even use the radio or TV. If anything, all those things were scary to him. He thought they were scary and bad things. But after introduction of TalkBox, he's more familiar with all these things and has embraced them. If he gets a ringing phone, he will take it to the owner or even pick it up and tell the person on the other end of the call that the person they're looking for isn't available. If the radio is playing on loud music, he can turn the volume down. So this is kind of showing that there's some level of experience with an interactive device that can actually move on to other contexts. And, and, and as I mentioned, these are kids who don't have a at the time at least, not a lot of exposure to interactive digital devices. It's very different from our landscape here. Um, and, and therefore, I think that that kind of amplifies the effect that these uh, experience have. Another uh, important point is that uh, within the stakeholder discussions, a lot of issues around uh, colonialism and post-colonialism came up. Um, and I kind of touched on it a little bit with the donated computers. A lot of these systems are not designed uh, in Kenya. And our participants were very much aware of this. And they were not wanting to have anything to do with this technology if it's not going to have local capacity to build. Right. So, uh, And this is a very, very difficult uh, question. Uh, we didn't have answers that kind of raised big questions in our study, which we would love to explore. And it, more importantly, people in Kenya uh, explore. If we can help, that would be great too. 
but an example of that from a disability advocate after seeing this device and, and some of the discussions was that, are the parts locally available or will, will we be able to use things that are locally available to form those parts so that they can be easily acquired or sourced uh, for the case um, of it is not functioning well? Are there technicians who are able to design the software, able to do a repair on the hardware? You see, so that in that it can run a longer course and have a longer lifespan. Participants also brought up issues around digital waste and electronics that if they are not sustained over time, they're gonna go to waste. So um, a lot of questions came up. We did a number of workshops with uh, technologists in that area to kind of talk to them more about the limitations and the possibilities of this technology. And there still continues. I mean, the conversations are not, they, they might not ever, but, but, but it's, it's an ongoing question, like how to make this, uh, a potentially uh, long-term uh, approach. One of the things that uh, I want to, another thing I want to mention, especially from an HCI perspective, is that uh, we had thought, and to some extent correctly, that having a device uh, could be a nice way to get the conversation started, especially with non-experts. So if we didn't have this prototype, it would have been very difficult to talk about DIY-assisted technology. In the first time that I visited Kenya as a way of kind of describing the project, I had a set of slides kind of similar to now. I, was, I didn't have photos of the device as much as I have now, but I was kind of talking about it. And it's very abstract. It's very different when you have something that you kind of try out. And you also see it breaking, see it like, see its limitations, see it running out of battery. Um, and so it was really important to have this uh, design for. One of the big challenges though, was communicating the scope of our project. So. Um, I still feel uh, sad when I talk to some of my uh, colleagues there about why is this uh, device not available um, and more broadly, right? So if it's useful, if people said that my child is not afraid of the phone after using this uh, and can kind of uh, practice basically working with an interactive device, so it definitely has some benefits, why aren't we able to make it available? Right, so it's big questions. I, I don't. I think there are some work that there is some work that you can do in academia and in, at the university level to kind of address that. And a lot of amazing work has been done here to kind of think about like well, how assistive technologies can actually be built and made more sustainable. Um, but that's an open question for this project. Okay, I'm gonna um, kind of pivot a little bit and just say that out of that uh, one. Uh, direction that came up was that um, this device is very restricted. Uh, how can we make it that it's more creative? If the engagement is the goal, how can we cre actually use it in different contexts? So I, I kind of have gone to a couple of different directions with this. One is, well, why not use it as a creativity device or music, for example? It could be a very small uh, piano. We can, think, we can actually load any audio. We can also make a more experimental um, audio with it. So we did some experiments with that. We also created the version that doesn't have keys, but uses um, RFID tags that you can put into any object and make them into a trigger basically for the audio. And uh, we had a, I was working with the school actually in uh, Baltimore and there was a child who was really interested in music. I think it, oh, I think Bruno Mars is that <laughs> city. Uh, Bruno Mars, uh, he, he loved it. He, he was just on, always wanting to play it. But he always had to ask somebody to play it. He would go on YouTube and then it would, YouTube would go to weird places. So they were saying, how can we have a device that he can just play whenever he wants? And so we created this um, and we kind of tried it out. Um, I have to say with physical computing uh, projects, COVID was a really difficult situation because this kind of put this project on hold. At, it's still on hold because a lot of people also that I had, I was hoping to work with have left uh, the organizations that they were at. Uh, but we do have the concept and the idea is there. So if there's opportunities, I'm really much more interested in exploring opportunities for creativity um, for people with disabilities. Um, kind of on that note, um, we're also become very much aware of the lack of, or the, not the lack, the dearth of conversations about disability and other aspects of identity. So for example, gender, uh, sexuality, um, and um, and also race, right? Among other things. So uh, at our university, we're kind of exploring what the, what does it mean to kind of open up the space for these type of things. And I have a couple of devices here. One on the right is a device is a kind of a 
it's not a prosthetic, it's a cover for a prosthetic that has some individual uh, art student design, co-designed with, uh, with somebody. And I think we kind of have to explore those type of collaborations. Why aren't visual artists building more uh, uh, assistive devices? Um, and and why, what, do, what those would look like? I mean, the functionality is really important and safety, of course, could be first order priority, um, but also the aesthetics are really important. On the left, we have a device for hearing aids that was uh, uh, asked for us to be made to blend more into African-American hair textures. The person that we were working with said that this not, nothing like this is available. And a lot of her clients are asking, why is this, do I have to wear this thing that doesn't match my uh, the way I look, right? So we kind of experimented with that and we're kind of continuing to do that. Um, one thing, another thing that kind of came out of there is thinking of, out of that project was thinking more about ecosystems, thinking about who are, um, what are the organizations and what roles can they play? So currently we have a collaboration with Maryland Assistive Technology Program to think about how can 3D printing be used and maybe the university lab um, can uh, support some of this 3D printing and, and fabrication uh, for people in the community, in the broader community, because they have a lot of reach into the community um, and people send requests to them. Of course, again, we have to figure out what's the scope of those requests and maybe we can't print complicated things or things that might pose safety issues. Um, um, I think with prosthetics, especially if they're used for mobility, I would be very, very hesitant to try to print them in the lab, in my lab at least, uh, because we don't have enough expertise or uh, good uh, printers for that. But if it's something like... Uh, uh, customized uh, grip or uh, like a smaller device that can be helpful, we're happy to do that. So kind of trying to understand some of those questions is kind of the next steps uh, for this project. And and the papers that uh, Jonathan also mentioned in, at ASSES are kind of exploring some of that. Okay, now I'm gonna definitely uh, take a different direction and I'm going to talk about, oops, Oh, I think this one should be highlighted, sorry. I'm gonna talk about living media interfaces, which kind of relates a little bit more to my uh, PhD research. And it's a long journey, uh, lots of different uh, directions, uh, but I'm going to talk about that. So uh, I, owe a lot, I, I have a, a, a big debt to the work that has been done here around participatory design and working with kids because the papers that I was reading when I was a, a, a PhD student, uh, we're kind of really coming out of here and several other places around the world. But uh, when you're, if you're doing kind of interaction design and children um, work, um, there is, it's, a, it's one of the hardest, uh, in my opinion, areas of design. Because um, I remember I was assigned to do this project with, uh, to engage kids who had um, communication difficulties to have more connection uh, with their family members. So siblings and parents and so on. And the reason I'm saying it's hard is that uh, children are very um, uh, direct <laughs> in, in the sense that the feedback they give you. So I would build these things and I would bring them to their home. I'm... Yes, yes. <laughs> this was all similarity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I would build something in the lab for weeks and then I would bring it to um, a, ho a home. And the child would kind of either like break it immediately, like pull out all the LED lights and like smash it and stuff. Or um, worse, press a couple of buttons and then walk away within three minutes. And the idea was that, well, I want them to encourage them to kind of use this. And I put this speech recognition. Speech recognition was horrible at the time, by the way. So I, I don't blame them too much. But like there was some interactivity. And I basically was at the end of my rope. So I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to get this PhD or not. But I spent a lot of times with families that I had that had very kindly agreed to let me try these prototypes. Um, and kind of talking with them and kind of also trying to see like what is the things that the kids like. These are very young kids. Uh, I was working between five and eight, so younger kids. So we were drawing things, we were kind of playing, we were talking to the parents. And soon it became apparent that they're very interested in uh, living things. So a lot of them had pets, a lot of them had plants. They were kind of also interacting with plants at their school. And this kind of gave me an idea. One little girl told me I want something that has a horse. I said, well, horse interaction? I don't know. I think it's possible, but I don't know if I'm that person to do it. I can't even write one. But anyway, that that idea was kind of big inspiration, actually. It kind of uh, put the plants, uh, put the seeds in my head to think about something that's very different. What would it look like if my computer, instead of 
having electronics had some living components and they were changing over time and they were reacting to our uh, behavior. What if there was a, some sort of interface that combines living organisms and digital electronic ones? When we think of a computer, we often think of something that's um, uh, not alive, right? Usually we don't think of that, but there's a lot of computation, quote unquote, happening in nature. Lots of computation happening in our bodies. Like how can that uh, be um, aligned? So I was thinking about uh, materials, and of course the horse came to mind, but that was not an option. And I thought, well, what about something that's kind of safe? Uh, what about mushrooms, right? So these are, uh, mushrooms are, uh, we eat them. I mean, the safe ones, there's also ones that are not very, very toxic, dangerous, but um, uh, they're kind of um, interesting because they're, you could build ones that are safe. There's actually, you probably have seen kits in supermarkets and schools where you can grow mushrooms. Those are food safe. So they are, unless somebody like, um, it's a whole thing, I think uh, otherwise it's not gonna be dangerous. So that was a big important thing. I, I bought a bunch of those and I started playing around with them. They change in their appearance and you can actually control them to some extent by giving water. So this can, this was also important because I wanted to see some change. And also changes are perceivable by children, meaning that they can um, actually, uh, it's not like months. You could also think of a tree as something that also changes, but it might be years. Like, and for kids, uh, there's a sweet spot that it shouldn't be too long, but also not uh, too little. Um, so those were some of the things I said, okay, I'm going to work with this. Let's see what happens. Um, and by the way, the term I have here uh, is participatory design with proxies. So I was working with kids, but I was also working a lot with their parents and their um, teachers. So that's kind of was the overall methodology. And, and after a while, I said, well, if you want to have a, a system that encourages uh, kids to interact with each other and to uh, play in the family context, what about something that actually can visualize um, uh, changes in, in visualize uh, some form of data that they're creating? So we often, I mean, data visualization is a huge area, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, what about data mushroomization, <laughs> right? So what if like we could use um, the, some characteristics of, of mushrooms to um, visualize data? So I built this system, I call it Rafir in Farsi, it means companion. And it's essentially for um, um, visualizing some form of data, very simple data, very linear data uh, for kids in the context of the home. Uh, a lot of the children that I was working with, as I mentioned, had communicating, communication um, challenges. Uh, and it, I was doing case studies. So uh, each of the cases were a little bit different. Um, and and it, it was interesting for me to see if they actually get motivated to uh, play games together, for example. In a lot of cases, we had collaborative games that the kids would play. And the more they played it, um, the idea was that the mushrooms would grow more. So. The architecture was pretty simple. At the time I was using an Arduino. Uh, so it was a physical computing project. Um, Arduino controls the water um, and then it would pump into the uh, mushrooms. And you have to do a little bit just uh, because otherwise the mushrooms don't like that much water, but they also don't like little water. So I experimented a lot in the lab to see what's going, what, what's the sweet spot. And I got some rain basically. Um, and yeah, so that was, that's the schematic there. You can do much better uh, controlling also with uh, uh, with, with other things like uh, ras Raspberry Pi if you're into physical computing. Very simple algorithm, water level um, kind of provides, uh, if you don't want to give no water or a lot of water, you don't want to kill the mushrooms, but there's something in the middle, right? So I was kind of playing around with this a little bit and uh, Essentially, the idea was that the longer, the more water is provided to, to the mushrooms, the faster they grow. Not super fast. There's not a button and they grow, right? So it takes a, a few hours. But it turned out that for a lot of the kids, not for all the kids, uh, but for a lot of the kids, it actually was enough uh, engagement. So they would kind of go um, to school, come back, see the mushrooms grow. They would sleep, come back, see the mushrooms grow. And they started kind of referring to them as little guys, like the... the, the uh, little mushrooms, they kind of were anthropomorphizing them a little bit too. And it actually did increase the uh, communication in the home. The parents were um, very, uh, every time I kind of was going there, uh, they were talking about how it, that some of the kids became really obsessed with these mushrooms. And they were talking about uh, how sometimes the kids would also 
even encourage their siblings to come and play the game so that the mushroom grows, right? So, and which was very unusual behavior. Again, this did not happen for all cases. I was doing a case study design, so we had a small number of participants. Uh, because I can't be in, or I don't want to be in everybody's home <laughs> for a long time. And the way we did it, we would, we would leave it there, and then we would go and kind of get a small uh, sample of data from the parents about what has happened. Uh, during that week. So, um, so that was the idea. What happened was that that kind of brought me to my attention that there's this whole range of possibilities for thinking about other ways of interacting with living organisms and not only watering them, see, thank you, uh, not only watering them and kind of seeing uh, big changes, but maybe changing their colors, maybe changing their um, kind of appearance or some other uh, form of behavior. And so we kind of conceptualized this with some colleagues uh, into living media interfaces, and it's an area that's growing, and there's a lot of work that is being done around both kind of um, materials that can change shape and so on, but also materials that can uh, be manipulated in some ways. Um, the area of biodesign is very big, and it has a small intersection with uh, HCI, but very exciting one, in my opinion, but I'm biased. <laughs> um, through that and through that conceptualization, I came to know of this practice of bio art, which I didn't know about, which is actually art that's created with living organisms, biological organisms. Um, art that literally works in the continuum of biomateriality uh, from DNA, proteins, and cells to full organisms. So um, what would it look like if we can actually think of a bio art project that touches on um, our relationship to technology. That was kind of one of the areas that I was interested in. Um, if you're interested in this area, there's a couple of, uh, there's many people in this space, but two that I would mention here quickly, uh, Joe Davis um, is a bio artist, uh, he's an American bio artist who's, and with Sarah Khan, they encoded a prayer uh, into the cells of uh, bacteria as a DNA code. And so when the bacteria uh, basically reproduces, these copies of this prayer are uh, created. So it's a conceptual piece. They actually created it too, but that's the one on top. And then Eduardo Catch, who's a Brazilian bioartist, created um, uh, an experience where he uh, translated a line from the Bible into DNA code, inserted it into living DNA cells, and then uh, exhibited into a, in a uh, uh, exhibit. So it's kind of a living poem uh, experience. There's some work in HCI around this space, um, but uh, there is not a lot that has been done. And so we did a study um, uh, a few years ago in 2020, looking and talking to bio artists and, and some bio designers around the purposes of bio art. And actually Nisa, as I see here, uh, we did that one together. And uh, so some of the outcomes that came out of that was that people were interested. I wanted to understand why people use living organisms. So um, there was uh, ideas around bio art generating transdisciplinarity, uh, transdisciplinary fluency, uh, meaning that it can create conversations and arcs between different disciplines. It can go beyond disciplines for a common purpose. Um, another aspect was that the familiarity and agency of living organisms is perceived by people differently. So that was important. Um, and then also it kind of brings up ideas of negotiating access. So for example, as a computer scientist, how am I going to create a bio art project uh, without having a wet lab? So these kind of ideas and these questions and conversations brought my, to my attention uh, to another organization in Baltimore. Uh, Jonathan mentioned it, BOGS, Baltimore Underground Science Space, which provides uh, after school programs for kids to engage with biology in creative ways. So, a lot of it is lab skills, how to, um, for example, do biological processes, how to do synthetic biology with low cost materials, which is very interesting to me because uh, the DIY aspect, it kind of connects the first project with this project, uh, is something that is an arc in my work. I'm interested in things that you can do with community, not only in um, very expensive context. And that's where I kind of started to work on a project. And, and we did a study here, um, Again, with uh, Nisa, Lydia, uh, the, the head of the, uh, Lydia is one, one of my, Lydia Stamato is my PhD student at UMBC. Uh, Lisa Shaitali is the director of this lab. And then uh, Justice Walker, who's a professor uh, in learning sciences. 
We did this study to understand some of the practices here and then kind of go forward in uh, maybe exploring the bio art project. And in this point, I kind of was thinking that, well, I'm going to move a little bit from bio design to bio art. And what does that mean? It's going to get a little bit personal here because art is often <laughs> very personal. And so I'm going to talk to you briefly about this project called Infinite Transformations that we've been, I've been kind of working on for, I would say, the past four years. Um, and it is kind of thinking about, uh, uh, the, the way I think about it is, is the meditation on timelessness. What would it feel like if you want to represent infinity and timelessness through a living uh, medium? Um, and I also think of it as a way of exploring human DNA interaction. So previously I was talking about human mushroom interaction in a way and living organisms, but what it would feel like or be like if you actually interact with organisms at the DNA level. So I'm from Iran originally, um, and in our country, poetry is really central. It's a really, really key part of the culture. And this is the um, tomb of, a, of Hafez, one of our most famous uh, uh, poets in Iran. And uh, poetry is also very contested in Iran. It's often an act of uh, political uh, rebellion. So there's a couple of poets here who actually went to jail because of their poetry, Umar Salehi and uh, Akhtosh Akhtin. And these are contemporary poets. Um, and kind of knowing about this poet, uh, uh, poetry that has been around for centuries and has survived a lot of turmoil, and also the the way that poetry is still uh, kind of enacted in our society, I wanted to explore um, how can I turn a poem, a Sufi poem that Hafez uh, wrote, into an object, into a, an object that embodies a metaphor, um, and and kind of use this as a way of uh, creating a meditative experience. So the poem I chose is this one. This is a line from uh, Ghazal. Ghazal. Uh, it's a very uh, famous one. A lot of people are familiar with it in Iran. Um, I'm going to read it in Farsi and then say the translation. Hargiz nami radan ke delash zende shod be ish. Sabtas bar jaride alam davam ema. One whose heart is revived by love never dies. Our continuity is written on the face of time. So I don't want to interpret it too much, but it is talking about love and continuity and change and so on. And it's very dear to my heart because as an immigrant, I always kind of grapple with this idea of what does it mean to bring one's culture and does it stay the same? Does it change? What's that process? And and I, as, as I was also seeing a lot of the challenges that are happening in Iran at the moment around uh, protests and so on, I was really thinking about um, the vitality of culture, how important it is to respond to the current moment rather than having a version of culture and saying, this is the right culture, everything else has to follow this and so on. How do we work with that? Wine is a very powerful metaphor in our culture. Uh, if you are familiar with uh, Persian poetry, it's used a lot um, for different reasons and in different contexts, mostly about uh, uh, devotion and transformation and, and a symbol for love. But also it's a very difficult concept because uh, it's uh, winemaking and alcohol is taboo. In, so it's forbidden, it's a forbidden metaphor. So I was very fascinated by this forbidden metaphor. Um, I'm kind of running a little bit short on time, so I'm gonna go quick on this one. But I'm just gonna say that there is a process where you can take a poem, in this case, um, this one, let's say one word, this is a, a Farsi word, Raz. And you can encode it into Morse code, so it becomes digital. It's a simple mapping. Um, and then you can uh, encode it into DNA code, CGTA, the four codes. You can do a bunch of, and this is uh, very interesting because I don't, I don't have a background in biology at all, so I was learning this from ground up. But there is a process to make this actually write, uh, transform this text into a viable piece of DNA code that then you can do processes to insert it into the um, DNA of living organisms. Uh, uh, I can go into a lot of detail about this. I won't because of time. But the idea is that the poem that's kind of hidden a little bit on the top there, the Farsi poem, goes to um, Morse code, CGTA, then they're combined. But you can't just combine it and uh, try to insert it into living organisms. That's not going to work. You need to have markers, which are going to be cut with um, enzymes, 
so that you can have that piece separated and then insert it into the right spot in the DNA code. Um, and actually, there's an interesting design question that I worked on with a uh, bio artist, or actually new biology, uh, unlike me, to come up with a design for this that could work over time. Uh, I sent this design to a company, and uh, they actually made manufactured the DNA code, and they sent it to me in a while. I couldn't see it, but I believe that there was a piece of DNA in there. Then we did some processes where we turned this into, um, where we actually inserted it into uh, copies of, oh, yeah, into living uh, bacteria. Um, and the living bacteria, we actually had a process to verify that the poem was picked up by them. Um, I'm simplifying a lot here, but anyway, bear with me. Uh, so anyway, we figured out we have the poem in the bacteria. Now we have millions of copies in the bacteria. What that means is that we can also freeze this bacteria and then we can use it again. But we can also extract uh, the, uh, the DNA code from there and insert them into living yeast cells. And once you have yeast, you'll have wine. You can make wine, you can make uh, bread, you can make etc. And there's, of course, a lot of uh, mistakes that can happen. And I think I killed a lot of bacteria uh, and a lot of yeast cells, but not on purpose. I, didn't, I do it, did it for art. Um, uh, but eventually, we had wine. And, and it, I did verify that it became a wine, not by drinking it, but by smelling it. Uh, so the alcohol was, alcohol was there. And at the end, we has this idea of uh, kind of an object. So the poem is actually embedded in the wine that's in this bottle. And the idea was how to represent, have this kind of multiple representations of the poem. Um, there's a lot, we, we, one challenge, a key challenge with bio art is that because a lot of this material is microscopic, it's very hard to uh, look at it, like to communicate it visually. So I've been working a lot with artists, visual artists, and uh, both from the biology side, but also animation and, and so on. Uh, and, and yeah, animation, uh, bio microscopic imaging, uh, to kind of get images of the bacteria, so, or, or sorry, the yeast cell. So this is an image of, the yeast cells with wine sediments, it usually looks like this, but you can actually uh, paint them and you can make them visually. I think it's very interesting to kind of be able to do that. And then I've been also working with composers to uh, create a representation, an audio representation of this uh, uh, project. And, and we have had an installation. Uh, I'll show the video at the very end because again, I'm running out of time. Uh, but an installation that combined visualizations of this bacteria and the, I keep saying bacteria, I'm sorry, yeast cells. <laughs> this might be an insult to the, uh, to the yeast cells and the wine and, uh, and the audio. So I'll show the video at the end, but, um, uh, I just want to, uh, yeah. Let's go. Okay. This is the video of the installation and the audio you hear is the, the, my voice saying the uh, poem and also uh, some transformations that are happening to it that parallels what's happening also in the audio. is coming through. Um, but what we're doing here is we're basically projecting uh, uh, images of the, of the yeast cells uh, onto uh, a very big parachute. And the parachute is on top of the bubble of wine, which is down here. And then there's a hand that's kind of writing the plant around the bottle.
I did a little bit of a fast forward by the, for the imaging, but if anybody's interested, we use the a Penrose tiling um, that can actually uh, uh, cover a plane into infinity without repeating itself. It's a very unusual mathematical uh, geometric structure or geometrical pattern that um, we wanted to use to represent infinity. Um, but anyway, the idea there is that, well, we have now this project, uh, how, the how the public are going to react to it? What kind of questions it opens up? And also, what does it say about what we were talking about, about negotiating access, kind of the different spaces um, that enable this type of work? So. Okay, uh, I wanna also thank my students and, and also collaborators, so without them, none of this would be of course possible. And then thanks and happy to take any questions or happy to chat with you afterwards as well.